Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's, it's fun to be here. I hope you don't mind I'm wearing a t-shirt, but I guess you guys are. <laughs> it's, it's Friday, so I'm, and uh, you guys run around in scooters, I know, so I figured I could wear a t-shirt. So. Um, Thanks, thanks for taking the time uh, now to come here. We're going to play just a few things. We, I think we have 20 minutes to play some music, and we're going to play a little bit from a couple of the pieces on this album. Um, the biggest sonata on the album, it's one of the big pieces in the repertoire for violin and piano, is that of César Franck. And Franck was one of the great romantic uh, French composers at the end of the 19th century. And um, he actually wrote this piece, this, the Franck sonata, which is one of the most popular pieces in the repertoire. He wrote it for uh, a violinist, Eugène Isaïe, who was one of the greatest violinists that ever lived, and he lived at that time. And it turns out he, uh, this was written in 1880 for him. He actually ended up teaching the man that became my teacher. So, because um, he was, anyway, it's a it seems impossible because the 1880s, but it is actually true. Um, <laughs> and so I feel a particular connection to this piece. But it's, uh, we're going to play just the last movement. It's a very tumultuous piece, very passionate piece. The last movement is where the sun kind of comes out, but we're just going to start start with that, um, with the last movement. It's a, uh, I won't say anymore. You can Google, Google the rest. Okay.
before we move, go on to the next piece, I just want to mention that Jeremy Dank here, some, I'm sure many of you know him. Uh, he has an am amazing blog uh, called thinkdank.com, which is followed by hundreds of thousands yet? I don't know, a <laughs> lot of people, a lot of people. Um, and he's, niche. He's, he's one of the great pianists on the planet today. Not, he's not just my accompanist. I'm lucky to ever to get him to play with me. But um, I did get him to play for this album, and he's anyway one of the greats. Um, anyway, we're going to continue with a little bit from Ravel. How many of you here call yourselves musicians? Are there, are, are there some musicians? I assume there's probably several. Yeah, OK. Well, I'm um, just, just curious. This, this, this piece by Ravel was written in the 1920s in Paris, um, just when jazz was sort of making its way, uh, getting really in fashion. And, uh, and Ravel was intrigued by jazz. And in fact, he met Gershwin. Um, Gershwin actually came to Paris. He wanted to study with Ravel. And Ravel refused him, said, you're doing great. You do your thing. Don't try to be like me. And um, he actually asked Gershwin how much money he made. And Gershwin told him. And he said, you don't need to study with me. Because <laughs> Gershwin was already very popular. But you'll hear in this, we're going to play the last two movements. Um, of the piece. This, this first one we're going to start with is the middle one. Uh, it's called Blues, so it's influenced by jazz. And, um, and the last movement is a perpetual motion, very short, and uh, kind of gets kind of crazy. Before we get to this, though, I thought we'd play a one-minute prelude uh, by Gershwin. So this is the first uh, Gershwin prelude arranged by Heifetz for violin and piano. <laughs> Thank you. 
Last little little piece. Um, okay, well, we'll 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 end with uh, a little piece, a, a virtuoso uh, piece written f by a by a sort of flashy rock star violinist of the 19th century called Sarasate, and he wrote this piece. Um, I think I first played it when I was 11. Um, I haven't played it in many years, but uh, I actually played this once on the Johnny Carson show, and in, in, uh, I don't know if any of you know who Johnny Carson is. Um, I was a teenager, and I, his last couple of years I played a few times on his show, and I remember playing this piece, so it um, makes me nervous when I think, think about this piece. So that's why I haven't played it for a while, but we're going to try it. It's called Zigeunerweisen, and it's, which means gypsy airs. It's called gypsy airs, so it's a gypsy, sort of fake gypsy piece. <laughs> Thank you. 
me, a uh, gentleman watching you play, was the incredible uh, passion and physicality um, and um, simpatico kind of way you riffed off each other. Um, obviously, a lot of time uh, in recital together. How many hours would you say you guys have played together? Because you were... 10,000. No. Have you ever read, the, <laughs> you ever read Gladwell's book? It's book. exactly 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, we've played a lot together, and we've uh, both been playing our instruments for, since for since a very early age. I was four, and you were what, five. five when you started. But we've been playing together about seven years, and um, and uh, it certainly takes a lot of work. But there's also a certain amount that you need a chemistry, and there's and we understand the language of this music, so there's it gives us the freedom to. It's like you know, jazz musicians; they don't. Sometimes they don't rehearse at all, and they just get up and play, and you wonder how on the earth did they, but they understand the language and the rules, and they can, uh, and they can take liberties, and, and the other can pick up on it, and so well, it's a nice see, feeling when Jeremy, you have that chemistry. Jeremy, you were chemistry. doing that. You were looking at Joshua quite a lot and just taking cues from his body. I have mean, to his keep back an eye on to him. You. Yes. <laughs> Actually, the violin is a very, um, the bow helps a lot. It's a lot harder to know when a pianist is going to play but the bow is very... You can lead, you can do a lot from the way you use the bow. I actually direct, I'm the, I'm the new music director now of the, you mentioned the, the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, which is an orchestra that's made many, many recordings, including Amadeus soundtrack and a lot of things. And I, I, when I conduct them, we don't have a conductor waving a stick. We do it just from my gestures from playing the violin. I play, wow. sit in the first violin seat and I conduct Beethoven symphonies and things like that, just from, from, a, from body language and little nuance of body language. So you can show a lot that way. Very cool. But you can also, listening, I mean, if you just, you, we could probably play with our eyes, both of, I mean, I play a lot of the time with my eyes closed. Yeah, they were closed. And you can just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you can feel what someone's gonna do and the way they lead into things. It's, there's a logic to how one does things um, that makes it inevitable knowing where you're going to land, you know? And so if you have the same sort of, uh, uh, musical ideals, you know. That, um, if you pl I played with other people that I have no idea what the heck they're doing, and um, <laughs> and I have no everything is a surprise, and that's that's not comfortable. Well, it's clear virtuosity, and it's obviously you guys uh, play beautifully together. It was our pleasure to hear that. Um, so besides, you know, Google and Carnegie Hall, um, <laughs> it, uh, what's been the most interesting place each one of you has ever played? Because you both, you probably have overlapped a lot, and I'm sure you have different experiences. Jeremy? Actually, most recently, I played in my parents' new retirement home. Oh, dude! <laughs> to, to how's, very, the very, how's the career going, Jeremy? Very middling acclaim. <laughs> And it was quite a quite an experience. The comments and the ex general ambiance. It was also an electric piano. Oh, jeez, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know it's it it's really fun. Uh, of course, uh, my favorite place to play is in in a you know hall like Carnegie Hall or even a smaller hall. I love small hall like Wigmore Hall in London. Was very intimate in the audience. Everyone is a diehard, you know, lover of the music. They know every note, and there's something really wonderful about that. But it's also fun to play in, you know, crazy places. I've gotten to play. I've done a concert at Central Park outdoors, you know, for hundreds, thousand people. I played on Red Square in Moscow. Um, this summer, I played in Athens at a Greek amphitheater outdoor, you know, two thousand year old amphitheater. For, um, there's so many fun places to play and and uh, interesting. Remember? Remember the castle we played in where it was open air and the electrician went home after the first half? Oh, yeah. Was that in, where was that? Spain? Yes, Mallorca, in Mallorca or something? Yeah. 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 Play in the dark. We played yeah. in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> With your eyes closed. 
Uh, well, here's if you Google uh, Joshua, you will find a story in the Washington Post in 2007 where he actually played for uh, money in the L'Enfant Plaza metro stop in Washington <laughs> D.C. as a lot, of, yeah. a lot of a lot of federal workers went to work, and he made 37 bucks that day. How uh, many of you know about that? I'm just curious. Like, look at that. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> That's it's it, that thing just took on a life of its own. But think about it. So here's Joshua Bell. He'd been performing uh, in in D.C. for money just a night or two before, where people paid lots of money a seat to hear him. But in the you know to and fro of getting to work, very few people stopped. Very few people. Few did. Some noted that you were a special player, but still carried on with their life. What did that tell you? Teach you? I don't know. Or people, shallow. People, people seem to get different things out. The article was quite well written. It was a very big, in-depth article that he interviewed the people who had walked by. Probably most of you have not seen the actual article, which is in the Washington Post. It was a huge thing, and he won the Pulitzer Prize for it. Most, most people see it through the email, sort of viral email things that get sent around, like condensed. People seem to glean different things from it. Um, I think, for me, it just showed me really what the... The, the the context in in music and also be, is, is very important that you're also that your brain is completely active you know that you're captive that you're listening that you're con contemplating and absorbing what's going on if you're rushing to work it doesn't really mean anything you have to have th there's a the equation includes the audience um, and that's very important it's like you know in the theater as well you have to be hanging on every word you have to you, you can't just throw it at people while they're uh, while they're running to work i think some people thought it was really you know disturbing that people wouldn't notice you know but i i, I didn't feel that way i, I think um we we kind of, one of the other things i think we do kind of live in our own little little worlds you know especially now with technology we're all we, everyone most people have headphones on most people are texting and and vir having in their virtual worlds and not really connecting with what's happening around them i think um uh, I noticed that while I was playing for the people in the metro, just all the all these masses of people, but not a lot of connection between the people. You know, it's mm -hmm. just a, and um, and certainly a lot of people didn't even glance up in my direction, even though I was making a, quite a noise. <laughs> it was um, in a cavernous space, really beautiful space for the Stradivarius violin that I'm playing. It really made a, it was like a cathedral sound, but most people kind of just kind of walked by, hardly hardly even looked in my direction. I'll ask one more question, then we'll go to the mics. Um, the instruments you prefer to play, obviously, is Stradivarius, a 1713 Stradivarius. We want to hear about that. And Jeremy, do you only uh, play Steinway or, I guess or electric? Just, I've just become a Steinway artist, whatever that means, which uh -huh. means I only play Steinways on pain of death. Oh, you're like yeah. uh, you're like <laughs> Tiger Woods and Nike. It's kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it cool. may be worse than that. I don't know. <laughs> But I'm happy to play a lot. I, you know, it's a very personal. Each piano is so different, actually. So it's always a mystery when you get to the new place where you're going, whether you can make friends with it or you're going to have to just learn to like each other grudgingly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's in some ways that's more difficult for the pianist because he does never knows what he's going to get. I mean, for me, I I have I bring my instrument. On the other hand, I have to pay millions of dollars for my instrument, so it's, <laughs> it's uh, cheaper to be a pianist. Um, <laughs> so I, I have uh, my violin is 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 uh, seven. It was made in 1713 by Antonio Stradivari, the sort of the the Rembrandt of violin makers, I guess, and they're they cost about that much. And and um, it's 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 an amazing though, a very inspiring thing to have. You know, every day I open my case and I have this really one of the great masterpieces of. The human kind, you know, the, and I get this inspires me to practice, and um, it's 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 kind of a it's a it's kind of a miracle th these instruments that are still being used for what they were made to do 300 years later, and doing they work better than anything can that can be made today. It's sort of a mystery, but uh, it's it's worth it. Well, you guys cut your CD at the Museum of the Musical Instrument. I, That's that true. Yeah, we we just we recorded it at a place. There's a new museum in Phoenix called the Musical Instrument Museum. They have a little concert hall. And we used that as a venue to to uh, to record this this album, French Impressions. How many Stradivari are there around? There now? are probably about 400 in the world, maybe. But th there many are not in good condition. So of the top ones, there's just really maybe 50 of the really great ones, and many of them are museums, and so they're very very they're hard precious, to, to, yeah. to find. I mean, yeah. Wow. All right, guys, I'll go turn it to you. Oh. 
Uh, so thank you very much for coming. I actually had tickets to see both of you at Carnegie Hall, and I missed it because I was traveling to California. Oh. On a lark, I looked up the San Francisco Symphony schedule, and I missed you guys there by a week. So I was like, wow. well, you're coming here. You must be hunting me down. Are you stalking yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Collaboration. I guess we're your stalkers. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, on that note, uh, can you guys talk a little bit about the background behind your collaboration, how you guys met, what made you guys decide to work together, and I guess most interestingly, um, what did you learn from each other over this collaboration? I think Joshua's mother figures very prominently in no. But yeah, she does. Well, explain that, please. please. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I was I went to Indiana University Bloomington and Josh had just left actually I went to study with a Hungarian guru and having and I stayed there for a long time in the way that people do when they get there for some reason and Joshua's mother is still living there and very much going to concerts and very much a presence in the scene unmissable and she decided that we should play together one of these days <laughs> and uh, but then we didn't really meet until the Spoleto Festival in Charleston in 2004 when yeah, I mean, we both knew of each other, his reputation, and, and, and he knew about me. We, we kind of, I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana, and I went to school there. That's why my family lives there. But my mother did, used to say, you know, have you heard this pianist? He's really great. I, he's really the best out there. You've got to play with him. So eventually we happened to overlap at something. We played a piece together, and we clicked, and, and uh, that was seven or eight years ago, and we've been, you know, we've played ever since. Um, Every year we carve out a little bit of time. This year we're playing a European tour together in May, um, and, and we made uh, this this album. So it's it's uh, what did we learn from each other? Well, we're always you know learning from each other. That's you know finding first of all finding chamber music collaborators is like it's like finding really best friends or or you know or romantic partners. There aren't that many in your life that you really that you're going to click with uh, in your lifetime. That you're 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 really your best friends for life. And to find one that really clicks is very it's a great find and so when that happened we um uh we knew something was you know was going to work and and then for after that it's the rehearsing process we we learn from each other you know we we discuss the music we discuss our views we come from different places uh, the same music we and so different minds uh, approaching it. it's basically a puzzle you know a piece like this it's a puzzle that's left by someone 100 200 300 years ago it's just notes on a page, then you have to figure out really what he meant by it. And then two people trying to solve this puzzle, it's just you, you learn from each other from that. So it's really a lot of fun, that process. Thank you. Of all the notes and phrases that you uh, played for us today, which was the hardest to hit and why? <laughs> hardest to hit. <laughs> wow, that's a tough one. I, I don't think they can be really ranked in before. that way. Right? Um, well, there's certainly technical, you know, there are certain places in the piece, you know, the thing, that last piece for me is a very technical uh, piece. There's some, you know, definitely had some triple axles in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's more than that. It's, it's not really, I mean, it's not, but luckily we're not, you know, you guys aren't putting up uh, 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 scores, because it's more, more than that. You know, it, the, it's, it's really about creating the musical atmosphere and not whether you hit every note is, is it's nice if you can and you practice as much as you can, but that's really not what it's all about. And so some of the hard, the hardest thing is sometimes just beginning. You know, just getting drawing right from the beginning, drawing the mood, um, is something that's uh, that's sometimes the hardest thing to do. Is just to because you want to grab people right right from the very first notes, and that's um, that's something that uh, you always work on. And pacing the the narrative of the whole thing so that yeah, the, yeah that it works that's as a story. Pacing is like it's it's you know pacing a piece uh, something that w the audience doesn't always think about how you've done it. You just audience, especially if you don't if if you're not if you're if music isn't your life and you're just listening to a piece, you don't really think about how the piece is paced necessarily. You may just think whether it work, works or not, whether you're bored, or whether you, whether you were excited or whether you were drawn into it. It's the same like movies, you know. Um, if you just know if a movie works, if you get into the business, you start to understand what the director's done. To make it work, and uh, what a director does, I, you know, is pacing, knowing how to pace the actors, knowing how to to cast the narrative so that it doesn't peak too soon, that the audience, that the actors aren't crying at the beginning for no reason if it hasn't been set up by the proper, you know, th all of that is being set up in a movie, in a film, um, so that for the emotional impact to work, and that's the same with with uh, music, and that's what we do, and we work a lot on the pacing of timing and and hitting the right emotional note at the right times and saving for the right moments, et cetera, et cetera. Hi. 
So there's a small black clip that I saw you move from one place to another on the oh, violin. What is that? That was a mute. That's a mute. mute. It's, oh. um, uh, it's, it's a little thing that you put on the, the bridge that the strings rest on is really responsible for transmitting a lot of the sound from the strings to the instrument. And so if you just mute it the slightest bit with just a little piece of plastic, the sound diminishes greatly and it gives a more somber, it, it eliminates a lot of the high overtones and it gives a more sort of sweeter, somber sound, which was an effect for that particular melody uh, in the piece. So it's called, it's a mute. Hi. Um, my question is kind of related to the one before that. Um, the mute? Well, no, no. no. <laughs> um, you know, hitting the notes. Um, oh. Because I, I, I remember reading a book about, you know, like modern performances tend to really strive for the perfection that a recording hmm. usually try to achieve, right? And people get used to that. I mean, because mm, we true. listen to CDs a lot more than going to concerts. So we kind of expect that, oh, this guy had, you know, if you're playing a round note, nah. Um, but then, but actually there's, as you said, you know, there's so much more to you know, music than just hitting the right notes. And actually, I mean, live music is so much more you know, uh, enjoyable to I agree. than mm -hmm. CDs. But so would you comment on that, like the listening habits of, of more than you know, audience, does that play you know, like a positive, negative thing on you know, the performance? In the, in the end, you, we can't really worry about the expectations of the audience. First of all, our own expectations are usually we set them higher than uh, because we're perfectionists and we're never happy. So we we don't we're not really playing thinking oh what is the audience they're going to worry about if we hit miss it no at least I I don't I don't do it, it's and it so depends on how many I guess at a certain <laughs> point <laughs> yeah after a certain point <laughs> it starts to add up you start yeah. you know refund <laughs> refunding them the money but um, but uh, I think it is true though that with modern recordings we're so used to perfection. Um, and uh, and in pop music, my gosh, in pop music, every all these pop artists, it's all a, it's all a, with most ninety percent of them, it's all done in the studio. You know, all the pitch control, all the thing. Most of the pop artists can't actually even do live performance properly, which is kind of a sad thing. We're used to all this stuff that's done be, done, and, and I love live music, but and some of the, my favorite pop artists are the ones that can really get out there and play a live show that really that uh, that's uh, that's the real. What do you thing. guys like pop? Pop quiz. Nobody. I was just saying that to. to um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I used to be. I like this old, like old stuff, like the seventies, like Genesis and Beatles and stuff like that. Um, Sting, I've played. I played with and oh done yeah. stuff with him. I like. He's someone that gives a great show. That really is a real musician. Like. It's not just uh, sorry. I'm being. This sounds really snobby to say so to talk about pop musicians that way. But um, a lot of them, I'm afraid, you know. Um, well, Millie Vanilli was the right. was the first <laughs> big example. But but um, but we're getting off the, off the the track. But we're used to this perfection. Um, and um, in in classical recordings, everything is is also we do the same thing. You know, we we correct everything and we splice in a note here from another take and. Well, you do. Oh yeah! Oh. Uh, you should. I'm playing from the score, and there's all kinds of hilarious numbers written. You know, two bars and take something. something. From a record from the recording session. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. I mean, because you really now we're used to it, and uh, myself, I don't want mistakes on the record. They can you can let them go in a concert. You forget about them. But a record, they have to, you know they're going to be there forever. So it's a little daunting to make re recording. Is um, so so I, I just love live performance. That's where it, for me that's what it's all about. As, as much as I want to promote our new album, it's uh, for me live is is where it's where it's at. Okay, thanks. Um, another question is usually like a wrap up question here. Um, like you know, people usually ask, you know, um, do you use Google products? <laughs> um, I would like to flip it a little bit. Like among all the Google products that you do use, is there one that you like the least? Oh like wow, the least. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, well, interesting. Well. Actually, Jeremy t Jeremy got me to switch from the Apple to the to the uh, Android phone. Um, from um, we're on our way to Apple after the, after this, so we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're gonna get my story straight. Okay, um, yeah. So we're using we're both using the same right Infuse uh, Android phone, which I'm really enjoying the flexibility of, of the of, of the Android. What don't uh, um, it's harder to s it's harder to sync the Android phone. I'm having a harder time. Like it's not as seamless. Uh, some things with Google are working. Some of the things aren't working so well. So can you work on that? <laughs> work on that. Um, but I really love Google. I love the whole thing. I use I use. I mean, obviously, we all use the 
the internet search, but um, I, I'm now trend becoming more of a, it's becoming more of my way of life, the whole um, uh, context calendar I use for, for all my, you know, my publicist and my agents and my assistant, we all do use Google Calendar as a way to kind of c convene um, online and, and sync everything. That works fantastically. You have to um, start doing Hangouts then. Start doing what? Hangouts. You can do. What is you can have a video hangout on Google Plus. Oh, I haven't done that yet. It's yeah. easy and do it. You'll love it. I'm yeah. hanging out plenty already, so <laughs> it's bad. You could do it virtually. Right. I don't know if we. Had, I, I didn't think. I couldn't think of, of anything. What don't you like? Uh, what What has been? We're I want. I want more email themes. I don't know. Uh. Is that bad? I just. No, it's good. I, I'm not satisfied with the current offerings. <laughs> I know that's very silly, but I wish. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That's good. So I had one related question to that that I wanted to ask. Um, many of us, I think, have learned an enormous amount about music, my family in particular, about classical music from YouTube. We get mm. to see things, performances from sure. decades ago. Me too. Amazing. Things Me that too. We get. I was wondering how you use that, because it's a, it, it must be something of uh, interest to professional musicians like you as well. Oh, I sit for hours watching. And people have uploaded, legally or not, wonderful old recordings, uh, for example, the Julius Katchen playing. It was a great old uh, Brahms expert who died suddenly of, I forget what, cancer, I think. And, and you don't hear his recordings anymore. And they're all on YouTube, and amazing things. And only, it's kind of sad. Sometimes you see certain things with you know, millions of views. And then this recording, which is one of the greatest recordings ever made, I think. Uh, it's like 234 views. You so know. put it on yeah. thinktank.com. I should, I should. You're right, you're right. You'll I don't double do too much. It. Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> YouTube is also the bane of, can be the bane of our existence as well. They, things are put up of, of, uh, of mine that I never intended to be up there. People sit in the rehearsals and take uh, out of context things that are not supposed to be up there and then, all, and, and, um, and, and put things there that are really not meant for consumption. It really, you know, it's upsetting sometimes. And also, also the, whole, the whole culture of criticism from anonymous people is really becoming we're really becoming, uh, something has to be done about just, uh, I don't know how, but just uh, uh, restoring some kind of etiquette and respect for, for people. Uh, just It's amazing what n normal people will do, become monsters in what they write about, because they're sort of anonymous and uh, criticizing people the way they look, the way they, they um, the way they, you know, just saying really horrible things. And, and many of us, we're, we're actually reading these things, you know, um, and and, um, and and it's just really mean. And you know, there are some of the great violinists like you know Heifetz. And uh, when my teacher used to Gingold, uh, he was uh, he lived here in the twenty twenties in New York City. They, he used to go to every concert. They all the violin young violinists would go to every concert, and and they respected all of them. They were each each one was like there are these icons. I don't, I really don't think that they were all like being so negative about it. Here now on YouTube, it's like everybody picks the one they like and they, they just trash the one they don't like. And there's not a respect for, just a basic respect for, and I, I don't know if that's that's sort of the internet thing and I don't know what um, mm. what will, if it'll ever change. But. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for your time. And honestly, it's a delight. We could go on for, I have a lot more questions, but I get to have lunch with them, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, please go and pick up the CDs if you haven't. Get some for your parents, your siblings, your loved ones. And uh, we wish you the best. I think you're performing tonight at City Winery, isn't at that right? At the City Winery, in, uh, which is another unusual venue for us. But, That's um, a little weird, yeah. And uh, anyway, thank you. I know you all have, could have had other things you could have done with your hour. So I really, really appreciate that you Nothing chose it to this. come here. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.